Welcome back. So let's continue where we left off. And the next thing I want to talk to you is, ironically enough, probably the most important thing in this lecture series, and is to not be frightened or forgetful of your two unit and three unit techniques. A lot of the time people will think, oh hey, it's just four unit, I'm not going to need blah 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 blah, but you never know, it might be the exact thing you need. Two common examples are like geometric series and similar triangles, and I'm going to show you an example of a question from my paper. In my paper, I lost a lot of marks for silly mistakes, but this was the only question I genuinely didn't know how to do, and it was because it never crossed my mind that I actually needed a three unit technique for this kind of question. So I'll show you what's going on. The idea is that you're evaluating this limit, which, trust me now, Lopatel's was not going to save you here. You're evaluating a limit of n to the q over some n choose k thing, and, well, I don't know how that's going to really turn out, but let's just see how things go. Well, in this question, the only thing, the only starting point I really have is basically just to use what n choose k actually means, which is basically convert it into the factorials. And what I'll do here is that, firstly, well, remember, limits only depend on, the limit here only depends on n, it does not depend on q, so I can just chuck the q in front, and that's not a problem. To handle this whole bizarre thing over here instead, what I'm going to use, I'm going to use, hopefully, a factorial trick that you've now seen countless times, and it's basically, the idea is that, if you have n factorial, you can basically truncate it by expanding some of it out, and then leave this bit here, so that once you're at n minus k, you keep the factorial, but in a way, it's as if you spat out all of the terms. And that gets me to this expression. And the worst about this expression, it's actually the whole <coughs> stupid, so annoying, dividing by the leading power on x limit that you've seen a lot of time in this three unit. And the idea is, what you do here is that the leading power of n is going to be n to the q, for both the top and the bottom, because you can count, there's going to be like q terms or something here. And then when you do the whole division, you end up with that. And it becomes the same old three unit limit that you've been given the whole time, just that you get something that's a lot more fancier. Um, that's a typo. That should be a q. I don't know why it's an s. Where did s come from? And another thing is, perhaps some of the reasons... One of the biggest reasons why people crumble in four units is because they aren't ready to just adapt to scenarios. You might be given a question and you might want to rely on stuff that you already know and basically use ideas from questions you've already seen as opposed to try out new ideas, which is the key to getting an E4 in, in three unit and four unit. And any E4 student is basically a student that knows how to do this. It's not a skill that you can just get on the spot. You have to do a lot of practice to do it. Keep gunning out the past papers, do as many as you can, it'll eventually come to you with more exposure. And <laughs> adapting isn't really something concrete, like there's all sorts of ways to adapt, because as you hopefully know by now, there's all sorts of questions you can be given in mathematics. And one thing that you might not be able to get used to so easily is the fact that intuition can be really, really helpful. And that's, intuition can be many things, it can be idea of how, it can be about knowing what direction to head, or it can be about expecting the actual answer, or it can be about when you feel as though an answer you've gotten is just plain wrong. <coughs> Excuse me, and I still remember during my trial survival lectures, a lot of people asked me for conics, just want to make a reminder about that again. When it comes to stuff like conics, mechanics, part of three units, occasionally even volumes, the worst thing that can happen is just Algebra, that is absolutely bizarre. You might just need to do a lot of battle with it, just keep wrestling with the algebra, and usually, if the question does seem like it requires a lot of this and that, and it might be really hand-wavy, battling with algebra can actually get you the correct answer. So, all I really have to say here at the end of the day is, don't be scared to do it. It's something that any equal student can do to a reasonably well extent. Keep gunning at it, and you never know, you might get exactly what you need at the end of the day, at the end of the day, after you do a whole lot of simplification. And perhaps some useful things that you might want to keep in mind when you're dealing with algebra. And, I guess the last thing for the exam techniques, yep. <coughs> the last thing I want to really talk about is basically just the traps. So I'm just going to read through this list. Dividing when you should be factorizing, that can be a big one. Sometimes you're tempted to just cancel out terms, 
when really what you should be doing is moving something to the other side and then doing your whole factorizing, especially when it comes to solving equations. You might think, oh, this is easy stuff, but honestly, even four unit students can walk into this mistake. Sometimes you might want to keep in mind, especially with harder three, you know, you might be given a question. Now, tell you, like, say, W, X, Y, Z, or A and B, they are all positive numbers. That is something you might want to take to your advantage. That allows you to do a lot of inequality manipulation that you otherwise would not be able to do. And then, on the on the contrary, sometimes you end up with negative numbers, and you shouldn't be doing that instead. <laughs> One thing that I think three unit and four unit students alike, they all forget, is the fact that, mainly because it's not really taught well usually, and the idea is that when you square root x squared, what you actually end up is basically its absolute value. <laughs> so if I square root 2x squared, I actually get root 2 times the absolute value of x. The only time I can really remove the absolute values really, really safely is when I know that x is a non-negative number. And that's something you really got to keep in mind, the definition of the absolute value. Sometimes you might end up doing a question <coughs> and you think, okay, I'm going to use the previous part, but then it might not actually be useful. And that's you never really know, as a rule of thumb, when you should be using this and when you should not be using it. And that's really, at the end of the day, a game of chance. <coughs> Just think, if it doesn't work, then you probably use the previous part at the wrong time and you might want to save it for later. It's usually the very last part of the question where you can be guaranteed to actually need a previous part. For anything before it, you never know. <coughs> and just a, once again, a last reminder, don't spend too long on the question, yeah. Alright, now, forget about exam, let's talk about studying advice. This is actually even scary to me, just seeing all the red that I wrote, but you should know it by now. Past papers, past papers, past papers, past papers, past papers, past papers, okay? <laughs> let's get out. <coughs> but then, of course, many of you will probably ask me, well, what about my textbook, and what about notes? Obviously, I'm biased, I think, I like to think that my four unit notes are pretty good, I hope, but... Honestly, when it comes to textbooks and notes, my recommendation is that they are what you use for re reference, and they are what you use for revision. <coughs> they might be good if you want to just focus on one little thing in the whole course, because it's just one little thing you can't get. And honestly, you can use them to your advantage as well with past papers as well. You can maybe just like do some open book past papers, which I don't know how really how much it helps because I haven't done it in ages, but it can be really helpful for some people to do a paper with with their book in front of them and be able to actually think about what's going on. And the idea is that as you're writing, if you're reading and writing at the same time, it's going to help you think a little more, little more easily. <laughs> but the idea is that at the end of the day, these are all going to be limited and past papers should be your number one priority. Okay? <laughs> and that 1.8 minute at most per mark, that was the guideline I gave at the in the first video, and that's something you still might want to consider for your own benefit. <laughs> Easy problems done first and fast, that's probably something you should probably do as well. Like I said earlier, get all the no-brainers out of the way. But this is a bit more relaxed in that if it's easy, you probably want to get rid of it as fast as possible as well. Don't forget to check the clock. Time management is always really, really important. You never know when you're going to be running out of time or not, or when you're going to be at risk of it. So always look up, see if you've fallen behind, and usually when I feel like I've fallen behind, I'll start rushing. And if I feel like I'm in a comfortable position, then I might slow down. <laughs> and at the end of the day, if whatever you did in the past worked, just keep doing it. <laughs> Nothing to say there. <laughs> Difficulty of topics, already talked about that for you. It's something that you might want to see to your advantage. Harder three units, most likely always hard, but the idea is that you should always go for the easy question first. And one thing that might be really helpful is just to balance out studying for what you have trouble with the most and what you have trouble with the least. Like, you never want to not study for anything, but if you find it easier, you probably can reduce the amount of studying and go more for basically what you'll find more of a challenge. Alright, and I'll just talk about this one without any lecture slides. So, whether or not you should start with the multiple choice or blah, blah, blah. <coughs> Personally, I always started with the multiple choice because I found the warm-up nice and relaxing. You just got me into the gun of things really quickly. Um, else you might want to start on question 11, because question 11 does get you into long response section pretty fast, and you start writing more in the long response naturally than in the multiple choice, so that's something you might want to do. The reason why I don't really like going for question 11 first is because I find the multiple choice, except for question 10, they're usually a bit more relaxed, 
and I want to get them out of the way first and not have to do that much writing and save my energy for later. As for starting for question 16, that is something you probably don't want to do at all because question 16 is going to be hard. You really don't want to jump straight into the hard questions without any warm-up and that's all I've got to say about there. Alright, and you do want to make your reading time valuable. Actually, this slide I'm not really going to go over. You can read it in your own time. I'm sorry. Alright. So I cut the lecture recording here and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up the paper that I sat. I'm going to basically mimic what I would probably do during an exam condition. You may or may not find this part not so useful so you can skip it if you want. All I'm going to do is I'm just going to explain to you my thought process and maybe just think out loud. And this basically will might give you an exam, give you an idea of how you might want to use your reading time. So I'll open up my paper and I'll see all oh, eccentricity, probably a no-brainer. I can prop some value for in this for this one. Can't even English today. A polynomial question. Well, okay, it's probably related to the roots. Double root at one, so that's something that I might be after. <coughs> polynomial double root. Yeah, okay, I'll just work on that later because I don't really care yet. Here, probably you know, just a moi formula, nice and easy. Integration by parts is a product of functions. No worries. Probability, okay, this will probably kill me a bit because it's home and comp, so a bit of me will die on the inside, and I hope that it's really, really easy and come back to it. Um, y equals f of x, translation, hmm, I could probably do this on the spot, and my guess will probably be that one, having just been seeing enough of these, really, not something that you might be able to do straight away. That, don't know how to do. That one, I know how to do, but I probably have to give a lot of thought into it. And okay, that's basically multiple choice done. <laughs> Easy. Very straightforward again. Your usual partial fractions. I hate doing sketches, but whatever. Nice and easy stuff. Ooh, something really, really interesting. But I think to myself, well, okay, question 11 probably not so bad this year. <laughs> At least, I think so. Uh, this might, I'll think about how to do, the one thing I really think about here is just how can I use vectors to my advantage, but other than that, I really don't know. <laughs> Probably another typical roots question for all I know, no guarantee, but that's what I'm counting on. That looks like something I've seen before during the amount of past papers I did, but it will probably take me a lot of effort to actually do it. So that's, that's something I probably mark as easy, but really, really time consuming. <laughs> a very typical volumes question, that looks like something I'll be really happy to do, because that's a very standard method. <laughs> Hyperbola, conics, hmm, verify the coordinates, Q, blah, 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 probably just parametrics again. Equation of the line, if the line is a tangent or whatever, it's going to be nice and easy. Prove that the area of triangle OPQ, well, okay, if you've done enough conics problems like me, that would seem like something that's moderately straightforward, but that would be a lot harder, and I'm anticipating really, really messy algebra for that one. <laughs> Here is the parallel cross-sections, and they want me to show that ABV was a root A squared minus H squared. Again, I've probably done enough questions to be able to get used to that. Keep in mind, I am trying to think as though I'm an HC student, not as a uni student. <laughs> that one was definitely an oddball because that was a related race question. First time it appeared in four units, don't know why it's there, but it was like a blessing. Just let it be and ignored it. <laughs> Differentiate sine cube, Arthur, I think, okay, this is probably something similar to, if not the exact same, as the reduction formula for your sine, sine integral, I guess. And then we need to evaluate that, sure enough. Again, seems like a very standard polynomials question. Nothing too fancy here, I hope. That's something quite common. <coughs> I'll see this and I'll be like, no, I want to not touch that yet. <laughs> because it's mechanics. And I'll see this, I'm thinking, oh goodness, there's going to be a lot of messy algebra in this year's mechanics questions. But it shouldn't be too bad. And then I think, well, hmm. That looks... <coughs> yes! Fair enough, I guess maybe 1 on x goes to log, might use integration, something like that. Some kind of limit. <coughs> this, hopefully I might work backwards and then I'll be able to get it out. Skip. There's a devil question again. 
And I look at this, I'm thinking, whoa, okay, so the last question is going to be some very, very nasty complex numbers and polynomial stuff. And basically, that's my reading time used up. Here, if I have any time left, I'll probably just, like, rush straight into it. But yeah, that's my reading time. And I'll see you in the next video.